Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time to gather um, with the saints. Thank you for the time to come and, and worship you. And we do want to give you all the glory because of who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. God, thank you for your word this morning, your holy word preserved for us, recorded for us, so that we uh, could become wise unto salvation, so that we could be led by you and know your heart. God, thank you for your spirit this morning as he leads us in the Christian life, as he leads us day to day to be pleasing to you, to pursue righteousness, to pursue Christ. And God, this morning we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for Emmanuel, God with us, thank you for his coming, and as we contemplate his advent, we come this morning uh, to this text and pray that you would guide us and direct us and teach us, that we might see him more clearly, that we might believe his love for us, and that we might, in response, love him more deeply. God be with us, in Jesus' name, amen. You would take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Our text this morning is the familiar somewhat familiar, prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. And it centers around this one word, Emmanuel, God with us. It's a key prophetic sign pertaining to an event that would change everything. The sign being the entrance of God himself into our experience in fulfillment of Old Testament promise and prophecy. And that is what this Advent uh, season is all about. It's quoted for us in Matthew 123, and we'll, we'll get there, where Matthew declares the prophetic sign fulfilled in Christ. And I've got to confess up front that Isaiah 7 is a difficult, uh, it's a difficult text to understand. There's far more clarity in Matthew chapter 1 in its fulfillment than there is in its prophetic context in Isaiah 7, but it's well worth our effort to understand it and to have our hearts turn, t- turn towards Christ this morning as we seek to behold him and worship him. In Isaiah Isaiah chapter 7, I want to read a large chunk here. Beginning in verse 1, we're going to read to verse 16. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, That Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, And say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands, on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it, and make for ourselves for ourselves a breach in its walls, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. 
For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. The year of our context is 734 B.C. And the nation of Israel is divided into two kingdoms. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And the king of the northern kingdom, Pekah, has made an alliance with Rezin, the king of Aram. And together, they're coming against the southern king of Judah to conquer it. Bringing the Davidic promise into question that one from David's line would reign on David's throne forever. The king of Judah is King Ahaz, who according to 2 Kings 16 was an unfaithful king. He did not do what was pleasing to God. Look with me in Isaiah 7-2. We're going to work our way through this text so that we can uh, flush out the context of Isaiah 7 to understand Matthew 1 better. Isaiah 7-2. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. The kings are coming. The armies are assembled. They've camped close to the border of Judah. And Ahaz and the people hear the report and they fear certain impending doom. They're going to die as these people come to conquer them. And their hearts are shaking. And the text gives us this great imagery that they're shaking like the trees shake in the wind. And living in America and living uh, apart from a wartime... We don't have that experience of enemies lining up on our borders and the fear and the impending doom that that would provoke in us. And we're somewhat insulated by oceans, but Judah was not. Judah had every reason to believe that they would be invaded and conquered by this alliance, except that God had offered a word of hope to them through the prophet Isaiah. Look in verse 4. Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands. Look in verse 7. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. God tells the prophet Isaiah to comfort King Ahaz that these two kings that are coming against you will fail. So calm down. He calls them two stubs of smoldering firebrands. These two kings are flashes in the pan, and they'll burn out soon enough. And this alliance and this invasion, it will not stand, nor will it come to pass. How does God know this? It almost seems like God has some kind of secret knowledge into the future. Listen to 2 Kings 15.37. 2 Kings 15.37. In those days... The Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, against Judah. How can God tell King Ahaz, don't fear Rezin and Pekah? Because God sent them. Because God sent them against Judah. He's moving the chess pieces in Isaiah 7. And he will bring them down in his timing. God ordains history. He ordains all of it for his purposes and for his glory. He moves things forward toward the goal of the revelation of his son and the accomplishment of redemption at the cross and ultimately the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ. The Bible contains a lot of history. But in many ways, it's a very strange history book. Not because the history isn't true, but because the history in the Bible is often neither linear nor exhaustive. The history that we're given is selective and partial, and sometimes God communicates in great detail, and other times generations are skipped. Entire eras are overlooked in the biblical record. Why? Because the Bible, first and foremost, is not a history book. It's a redemptive history book. It's a salvation history book, meaning that the history we're provided is unto a greater purpose of revealing Christ to us in types and shadows, a little here, a little there, then in final fulfillment in the person and work of Christ, but never simply for the sake of flat history. It's like a news photographer photographing a parade from a tall building. 
The parade is all of history, all of recorded time. But the photographer zooms in and out on the floats and the marching bands and the faces that he wants to document for his story. Some floats he skips, some he emphasizes, but he chooses what he wants to accomplish his purpose. The Old Testament tells God's story of salvation and foreshadows the coming of Christ. Listen to Romans 15.4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hope in what? The things that were recorded previous were written for our instruction that we might have hope in Christ. In light of the history that you and I are living through right now, as random as it may appear, in light of the recent election and the state of our world, rest assured that God decrees that history. He decrees every moment of it. In perfect wisdom for his glory, Isaiah 7 is redemptive history given for our encouragement so that we might have hope in Christ. Look in Isaiah 7, 8. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people. Verse 9, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. In 65 years, the northern kingdom of, of Israel, referred here as Ephraim, would cease to be. In 722 B.C., they were conquered by Assyria, and many were exiled to other countries. But in 669 B.C., 65 years from Isaiah 7, from this context, a mass of foreigners were transplanted into Samaria, the capital of Israel, and it would shatter the northern kingdom. It would cease to be a people. God is revealing the future to King Ahaz for his comfort and his peace. But he's willing to even go a step further than just revealing the future and give him a sign that these things would indeed happen. Why would God do that? The text tells us so that Ahaz would believe. So that Ahaz would believe what God is telling him. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. And so verse 9 is both an encouragement and a warning. If you will not believe, you surely will not last. So believe me, Ahaz. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. This is an amazing invitation of God to a human being. To confirm God's word to Ahaz, he says, go ahead, sky's the limit. You name the sign and I'll make it happen to confirm what I said to you. That is an amazing grace to a rebellious king. Not that God's words ever need confirmation in any way, shape, or form, but God offers it to him almost as an accommodation to his unbelief. It reminds me of Jesus permitting Thomas to see and to touch the holes in his hands. And Jesus tells him, Thomas, be not unbelieving, but believing. The warning is the same to Ahaz. I will offer you a sign so that you will believe. But Ahaz is not a faithful man. And he responds with this, with this false piety. He says, no way. How dare me? I would never do this. I would never test the Lord. Many think that he's thinking of Deut Deuteronomy 6.16 where God tells Israel not to put the Lord your God to the test. The problem is that God told him to ask for a sign. He instructed him to ask for a sign. And when the God of the universe asks you to do something, I'm going to go out on a limb, you should do it. You should do it. You respond. And so listen to Isaiah's rebuke on God's behalf in verse 13. <clears throat> Then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. By saying he would not test God, he was testing God. 
The Emmanuel sign is given as a rebuke for Ahaz's unbelief. He should have chosen a sign, but he didn't. And that's part of God's plan. That's part of God's plan because what would come out of this is a divinely chosen sign for Ahaz, but also for us. A sign for us in Emmanuel. This is the essence of the sign. A boy named Emmanuel will be born to a young girl. And as the baby grows to the point of moral competency, the threat of the alliance of Rezin and Pekka will be no more. Why? Because Emmanuel, because God with us. Every aspect of the sign is widely debated. Every aspect of Isaiah 7, in terms of the near context, is diverse. Dozens of explanations. But when we get to Matthew 1, the fulfillment is very clear. And so we'll bank on that. We'll bank on when we get there, it will be clear. I want to give you, a major, uh, I want to give you the major questions regarding the text, and then instead of surveying lots of options, I'll just give you my best attempt at, at synthesizing the, the, different, the, the text. The first key question is this. Does this sign have a near fulfillment to Ahaz? Or is it fulfilled exclusively to the Messiah in the first century? Often biblical prophecies speak to something immediate in the near historical context, and then they also can have a far fulfillment, a messianic fulfillment in the future as well. The context, what we've just read, kind of pieced apart, picked apart, it appears to demand a near fulfillment. There's too much said directly to Ahaz and his circumstances for this to only be a messianic prophecy. It doesn't work for God to say, don't be afraid of these invaders, Ahaz. It's not going to happen, and I'll prove it to you by sending Jesus 700 years later. There's got to be something in Isaiah 7 that's happening, a near fulfillment. The second key question is perhaps the most difficult. What exactly is the sign then? This hinges on the meaning of, of the Hebrew word Alma. It's the word translated virgin in verse 14. And it's very debated what this word means. On one hand, liberal scholars want to restrict this word to mean simply a maiden with no reference to virginity for the purpose of denying the virgin birth. On the other hand, the more narrowly we define Alma in 714 as exclusively virgin, the less and less reference the text has to King Ahaz and any near fulfillment, unless we're willing to accept two virgin births, which I don't think we are. The word Alma has a range of meaning. The general sense of the word does mean a young maiden. It means a young girl of marriageable age, and it is only translated as a virgin in the, in the NASB in this text. There's another Hebrew word used to emphatically describe a young girl's innocence, and it's used 50 times in the Old Testament for that purpose. But Alma is only only used seven times, and its emphasis is not sexual innocence. It's more of a general term for a young girl who's unmarried. But what's instructive is that in the Hebrew culture, a woman of marriageable age was assumed to be a virgin. So whereas the word emphasizes the idea of a young maiden, it certainly does not exclude the idea of sexual innocence. The key here, I believe, is to understand that the initial sign to Ahaz has a different emphasis than the Matthew 1 fulfillment. The language is there that allows for different priorities of emphasis. Sexual innocence is not the emphasis of the sign to Ahaz. The child's name was the sign. The timing of the boy's maturity was the sign. So think of it this way. King Ahaz, fearful of an invasion from the Rezin Pekka alliance, would meet or hear of a young maiden, most likely unwed, with a little boy and say to her, oh, what a cute baby you have. What is his name? And the mother would say, his name is Emmanuel. And this would be the sign to Ahaz. It would confirm precisely what God had promised. Aram and Israel would not prevail against him because Emmanuel, because of the boy, Emmanuel, God with us. And there was a timeline even given. Before that little guy knows enough to forsake evil and choose good, Rezin and Pekah are finished. You're not going to be conquered by these two. 
The alliance between Rezin and Pekah would be broken in about 732 B.C. Assyria invaded Aram and killed Rezin within two or three years after this prophecy, just enough time for little Emmanuel to grow up and begin to discern right from wrong. The speculation regarding who the child is, though, it ranges from Hezekiah, the son of King Ahaz, to Isaiah's son, to an unknown child, all of which have varying support. The issue, however, is not who the son is, but that the son is. That the son is, and his name would be Emmanuel, and he would be the sign to Ahaz. As we move to Matthew 1.23, and if you turn there with me now, Matthew 1.23, we move to different aspects of the Isaiah 7 sign. The initial sign is not exactly like the final sign. We move to a more glorious fulfillment. The virgin birth is the sign. The fullness of the name Emmanuel is the sign. God is now literally with us in Matthew 1. But the maturation of Christ is not the sign. Nothing is said of a time when, when Jesus would reach moral clarity and, and invading alliances would cease to be. And so let's read Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Follow along with me as it unfolds the fulfillment of the Isaiah 7 prophecy. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he, shall save, he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. I want to give us three implications of the Emmanuel prophecy. The first is doctrinal. We'll spend just a little bit of time on that, and the, and the last two are, are very practical. The first implication of the Emmanuel prophecy is this. The Emmanuel prophecy emphatically declares the virgin birth and deity of Christ. The text says that God is now with us. The virgin birth and the deity of Christ are essential Christian doctrines. The fact that God himself is the father of Jesus is no secondary teaching. Nor is the fact that the Bible states over and over again that Jesus is fully God, come in human flesh. The text clearly affirms that Jesus was not born by natural means. Five times in, verse, in these eight verses, the author tells us that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born supernaturally. And the Emmanuel prophecy confirms his true identity because he was born of God. Because God is his Father, the coming Jesus would be Emmanuel, God, with us. His manner of entrance into time and space was the indicator of his dual nature. Virgin birth, Son of God, God-man. And this is certainly doctrine to know. It's doctrine to believe and defend, but not just to be orthodox. This is doctrine to know and to believe because it's essential to being saved. It's essential to being a Christian. A person who denies the virgin birth and the deity of Christ is simply not a Christian. Not because I say that, because the text won't allow it. Because salvation won't allow a, a merely human Jesus. The Jesus that they are trusting in is the wrong Jesus. A Jesus conceived by natural means by a human mother and a human father is a Jesus who has inherited a sin nature from Adam and is therefore only a man. He can neither save himself nor save us because he's unable to do so. He must answer for his own sin. And he cannot be our sinless substitute. He's not the Savior because he needs a Savior. 
And therefore, he's not Emmanuel, God, with us. But thank God that the text is clear and Jesus is, in fact, Emmanuel. He is God with us and he is here for an exalted purpose. Isaiah Isaiah 7.14 meant something to King Ahaz. It assured him of God's temporal, physical deliverance from his enemies. But then that sign, it went dormant for 700 years. And it just sat there in the text until this moment in Matthew 1. This baby that Matthew is describing for us was the promised Old Testament Messiah. And he had come to deliver us not from an enemy invader camped outside our borders. Matthew 121 says he came to save his people from their sins. To deliver us from the eternal consequences of rejecting God, from the worst enemy, and that is sin against the holy God. God is with us in Matthew 123 to save us. And God has come to save his people, and Emmanuel was the sign that it was time for this redemption to take place and for people to believe it. The most important question, though, is who are his people? Because the angel is clear in verse 21 that the salvation Jesus has come to accomplish is for a restricted demographic. It is his people that he has come to save. And it is only God's people that can fully embrace the Emmanuel sign. Not everyone can say God is with us. Not everyone can say God is with me. And so who is God ultimately with? That's the question. The Christmas season can be a horribly deceptive time because it can Christianize our pagan culture for a time and bring a sense of peace and happiness and we can affirm something that is simply not true. Because people can go to church and they can give gifts and they can donate to charities and they can say Merry Christmas and you can decorate Christmas trees and set up manger scenes. And smile and laugh and spread all kinds of holiday cheer. And have some sense of security that all is well and God is with us. When in fact he's not. According to the very Bible that reveals Christ to us, it could reveal that he's not with us. Who did, who did he come to save? Who are those at the end of the, the, end of the day that can say, God is with me in truth forever. Can you say that? Can you say right now, God is with me? And back that up by the promises of Scripture and the realities of Emmanuel, God with us. The Bible often speaks in terms of proximity to God, of man in proximity to God, how close or how far he is from God. To say someone is with us could be a statement of mere spatial proximity. If I'm standing in a packed elevator, there's lots of people with me. But if I take a survey and I say, hey guys, are you with me? Nobody's going to agree. Nobody's with me relationally. They're just in my space in an awkward way. So it doesn't mean merely spatial proximity. Jesus arrived in time and space and the God-man was with us, certainly spatially, He was on earth among us, but spatial proximity is not the final redemptive design for which he came. God's mere presence on earth accomplishes nothing relationally, meaning no one goes to heaven because a baby was born in the manger. He came to be with us relationally by dealing with our sin that separates us from him. That through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, He would accomplish salvation and be truly with us. Well, more importantly, so that we would be with him. So that we would be reconciled back to God. Redeemed back into his favor and free from his judgment. And so the arrival of the God-man is not as simple as he wasn't here and now he is. The text is reaching for more than that. The entire Old Old Testament prophetic record had resonated with anticipation for this very moment when God would come near to save those who were far, far away from him. The second implication of the Emmanuel prophecy is this. Before God is with us, 
He's not with us. Think back to the Garden of Eden. God creates Adam and Eve. They live in perfect provision and perfect relationship. And God is with Adam and Eve. He was with them spatially. He walked with them. And he was with them relationally. There was no sin or rebellion that had disrupted the relationship. It wasn't a final or a full nearness, but it was, a, it was nonetheless a perfect nearness between God and Adam and Eve. And then sin entered into the picture, and they rebelled against God, and they died that day. Spiritually, they lost who they were supposed to be before God. And they tried to deal with what was broken relationally by inserting their own distance. And they ran from him, and they hid from his presence. Genesis 3.8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God's presence, his favor, it was life to them. It was pictured in a tree of life that they had access to, and now it was gone. And that relational separation was confirmed when God dismissed them from his presence. He kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. He was with them, and then he was not with them. And they had lost everything in a moment. Everything except the hope that God himself might remedy that separation. The hope that God might redeem them back to himself and that they might know him once again as, as Emmanuel, as God with us. Adam's death was our death that day. All humanity died that day. The spiritual death has been, that, that spiritual death has now been the status quo for every person born into this world except for Christ. And we enter in this, into this life and as cute as we are as little babies, we come into this world and God is not with us. Listen to Ephesians 2.12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were. Separation from God is a miserable, hopeless existence. Life is hard and relationships are broken and work is a grind and there's pain all around us and in us and we're left to speculate and manufacture our own purpose in this life and the years roll by and we have no hope because God is not with us. And though we have lots of friends and some degree of temporal happiness, we are alone and we are guilty inside because we don't know God. And then we get old and all we have is memories of the past and the impending doom of an approaching death. And then sure enough, we die. And we come to judgment without God at the end of life. And if there is no Emmanuel, if God is not with us, we stand alone before that God. To be utterly and thoroughly evaluated. And none of us can stand his scrutiny. None of us can stand before the, the holy God of the universe because no one has the perfect life that they can offer to God as vindication or validation that they deserve the glories of heaven. No one is worthy to be with God. And if you die without hope and without God in this life, Jesus will declare to you on that day the final verdict. And it is both spatial and relational and eternal. Matthew 7, 23. And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But thank God there is an answer to this disaster of the soul. And it's there in our text. It's Emmanuel. It's God with us. God gave Ahaz a sign that he would deliver him. He told him, calm down. The threat will not stand. It will not come to pass. Why? Because Emmanuel, 
because God is with you. But he also warned him, if you will not believe, you surely will not stand. You will not last. You and I face a far greater threat and therefore have been been given a far greater sign. The sign of a baby born of a virgin given to us that we might believe it. That we might believe him and in so doing be delivered from our sin. And brought back to God through the death and resurrection of Christ. And if you will not believe in the Lord Jesus, you surely shall not last. There is nothing passive about Christmas. The coming of the baby Jesus is a sign. It demands a response. A response of faith to remedy the separation between you and God. Listen listen to Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And as we come to Christ by faith, we become the people of God that he came to save, the people of Emmanuel, sons and daughters of God, who say with great humility and thanksgiving, God is with us. God is with me. The third and final implication of the Emmanuel prophecy is this. When God is with you, You lack nothing. You have everything if God is with you. The psalmist said it this way, Psalm 73, 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. The psalmist could equate God's proximity to him as his good. He is my good. His nearness is what I need. I can simply sum up all my good in this life with this. God is near. God is with me. He could sum it up in a manual. The gospel accomplishes everything we need in this life and the next. Paul says it this way, Colossians 2.9. For in him all the, excuse me, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. The word means to fill up and be full. You have been made full in Christ. God with us means relationally nothing stands in between me and the God of the universe. His justice has been satisfied in Emmanuel. My sins have been nailed to the cross, placed on Emmanuel. And by his death, he's canceled out that debt that kept me separated from him and would keep me separated from him for all eternity. And now he brings me in as his child having poured out his love on me in Emmanuel. And he is with me forever. He is with us in a saving way, intimately, relationally. God the Father is my Father. Christ Emmanuel is my brother. And he takes up residence in our very souls through his Spirit. And he dwells in me. And he forever testifies to me by his Spirit my adoption as his son, that God is with me. John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. God is with us every day, promising to never leave us or forsake us. He's with me in trial. He's with me in pain. He's with me in failure. He's comforting and reassuring that he is a God of mercy and grace, and he will not let me go, and no one will snatch me from his hand. He's with me in temptation, leading me and convicting me to abide in Christ, to love Christ, to believe the love that God has for me in Christ to obey him, to turn away from sin, that he is holy, that I am a new creation created in Christ Jesus to do good works. How? By Emmanuel. Because he's with me. He's with me in evangelism. He's with me in ministry. When I'm afraid and awkward and I don't have all the answers, listen to Matthew 28, 20. Right there in the middle of the Great Commission, Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
He is with me in this life, every day, every second, loving me and strengthening me to live for his glory and not for this world that's passing away. And in the end, when it's all said and done, and my days are up, he is with us in death. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. God is with us in Christ. Relationally, he could not love us more, and that means everything to the soul that has known the guilt and the hopelessness of life apart from God. Christian, do not doubt the nearness of God. Believe him, believe him, that God is with us in Christ. There's one more chapter to this story, however. Relationally, God is with his people. But a day is coming when he will be with us spatially once again. And faith will give way to sight, and we will see him face to face. And we will look upon Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and his presence will be our very dwelling place, and Emmanuel God will have its full and final expression. Revelation 21.2 And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. May this Advent season season be full and rich and glorious for you and your family for one reason, because Emmanuel, because God is with us, And because he is with us, we lack nothing. This morning, if you've come up short in answering that question, I'm not sure God is with me. I'm not sure I know how God would be with me. Then would you respond to the sign of the baby in the manger? Would you respond to Christ who has conquered death and calls you to himself by faith that you might know him and that he might be with you for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Emmanuel, God, with us. Thank you for fulfilled prophecy. Thank you for a final deliverance through the cross, through the blood of Christ. God, thank you for the great sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, to reconcile us to you through his blood. God, thank you that you are with us. You say it in so many ways. You prove it in so many ways. But most of all, God, in the cross, in Christ, we know that you are with us. Help us to believe that. Help us to live in light of that. God, count us worthy of living for Emmanuel in these days until you return. In Jesus' name, amen.